The Gospel of the Lord. say that Chris is doing an awesome job with the sound, though his father is away. Um, it is not him. It's for me. It's not turning on the mic. So it is on now. All right. The uh, title of my sermon this morning is Lifting Abuses Darkness. Drawn from the verse in the Gospel of Luke that reads, Pray for those who abuse you. The earth, the solar system, and the universe all move at alarming rates. But we don't notice. Cultural shifts can occur suddenly and are more easily felt, but we can miss them too. Sometimes societal changes catch us unaware. For example, when I read our gospel reading this morning a few weeks ago, one word surprised me. It's not that I haven't read the verses before, many times even, but after I read the word abuse, the passage was brand new. What was Jesus saying? Did he mean for us to pray for our abusers? We should know that Jesus is not above rhetorical hyperbole. In Matthew's Sermon on the Mount, Jesus exclaimed, If your right eye makes you stumble, tear it out and throw it from you. For it is better for you to lose one of the parts of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. Jesus didn't, really didn't want anyone tearing out eyes. That would be horrible. While he was using hyperbole in this instance, Jesus wasn't using it in this morning's reading. Was Jesus being coy instead? He certainly could have been. He often was when addressing the Pharisees and the scribes. Think of the woman who washed his feet with her tears. A Pharisee had invited Jesus to dinner, but hadn't offered him water to clean his feet, a custom faux pas. Jesus coyly used a parable to admonish the Pharisee for his disdain of the woman and her beautiful gift of tears. But in this morning's verse, Jesus wasn't being coy or using hyperbole. He was being earnest when he called for his believers to pray for their abusers. In this section of Luke's narrative, Jesus was teaching. It's Luke's version of the Sermon on the Mount from Matthew, and it is shorter than that version, known as the Sermon on the Plain, with only 29 verses. It focuses on a person's spiritual attitudes. Within this individual focused spiritual framework, Jesus mentions the word abuse for, critical, for a critical reason. Abuse is a powerful and dark word, especially in our time. The church pedophilia scandal and the Me Too movement illustrate the traumatic nature of abuse. Abuse is not limited to those areas. A quick online search identifies other kinds. There are emotional, physical, teen dating, substance, domestic, and animal abuse, to name only a few. 
Abuse is painful and destructive. Its memory can deeply bruise our brains. It affects the body, the mind, and spirit. And its damage can last decades. For some, such an experience and its impact doesn't go away. Here's how I imagine abuse's impact on the brain. I grew up in a house in North Stamford, Connecticut. The original house was a cape built in the 1920s on a hill in the woods. In the 1950s, an addition was added, giving the house an additional bedroom and a family room. Below the addition was an unfurnished cellar, which one could only access through a small exterior door. While as a boy, I could enter it standing upright, any adult had to stoop. And even after stepping down two steps, adults had to mind their heads. The cellar was a dark, damp, murky place with earthen smells rising from its dirt floor. Beyond the entrance was a pole string for the light bulb, which illuminated only a tiny area of the cellar. Two small windows meagerly lit other portions of the space. For me, it was always a nether world that had access to deeper realms of darkness where one could only see dimly. For many years, I walked by the door and one window on my way home from the bus stop. Even though I forced myself to look away, my attention was always on the cellar. Would I see something frightening in the window? Would a strange creature peer out or a ghost look me directly in the eye? I would always scurry by. Memories of, of abuse are like that cellar. The, in the recesses of our brains, unwanted memories have burrowed into crevasses and folds. They cling to our gray matter. If these memories would simply remain hidden and forgotten, we wouldn't care about them. But like the cellar's earthen odor, they return and can create unwanted moods, cause our anxieties to rise and make us fret about unrelated experiences. They won't let go or be forgotten. Given the hold memories of abuse have and their power on us, Many people can become knowingly or unknowingly emotionally or psychologically stuck. They are haunted by unwanted ghouls and shadows. Jesus knew that abuse and its memories can terrorize people, and it's why he called his listeners and us to pray for abusers, even if we are afraid to do so. What do we make of his call for us to pray for abusers? First, in this verse, Jesus does not want us to fix abusers. The Sermon on the Plain is not about changing others. It's not about changing the world. It has no view of social justice. Its words do not call for the creation of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus' focus is not on the abusers, and he absolutely does not want the abused to change the hearts of the abuser. We must pause at that statement. How many of us think, if I only confront those who have hurt me and wag my finger in front of them, then they will know how much they hurt me. They would then seek forgiveness, and our pain would be ameliorated. 
Jesus knows better. He knows the hearts of abusers. Remember all those times Jesus knew what his abusers were thinking, even before they even said anything out loud? In a perfect world, remorse would fill the hearts of abusers, but most often the confrontation will leave the abused mouth agape in a dark cellar of unfulfilled hope. Jesus knows it's God who can satisfy and soothe our pain. Prayer for those who abuse us heals our wounds. Prayer calms our minds, pulls those stubborn memories out of the dark, melodious cellar into God's cleansing light. So what's the best way to pray for our abusers? First, if the, memory, if the memories are frightening, then the help of a good guide, like a spiritual director, pastoral counselor, or therapist is a must. If not, then find a quiet spot. Begin with a prayer for guidance and comfort of the Holy Spirit. Once you've settled, recall the memories and jot them down on paper. There's something to the act of writing that helps the memory lose its temper and disarms its hold on us. Importantly, let emotions rise. Fear, hurt, anger, and more. Remember you are safe and under God's care since you are in prayer. Your feelings will not overwhelm you. They may wash on you, but will not overcome you. As you recall what hurts and the abuser, pray and pray fervently. Pray for hope, peace, comfort, strength, courage, and bravery. Let the Holy Spirit be with you and hold you as you remember. You are never alone. God is with you. Prayer will filter your negative thoughts with light and hope. You survived the abuses, even if you didn't feel like it at the moment, you withstood them. You were stronger than what happened. You are not your trauma. With God's help, you can see that you are stronger than your abuses. Finally, focus on the positive. Reshape your life story into overcoming the darkness. See yourself uplifting abuses darkness into God's light. God will refine these memories and help you reshape your life and your story into one of hope. <coughs> Abuse is never appropriate, never right. We must never remain in abusive relationships. However, if we feel stuck, pray. Pray to God to shine a light on the path to hope, bringing us out of abusive relationships. We Christians are people of light and hope. Through prayer, we can always find a way to thrive.